Good morning. What's up, guys? How we doing? Good? Okay, okay. That's good. That's good. That's great. Uh, I know. Some of you guys are like, uh, who are you? Who are you? Yes, I shaved. I shaved. Hey, by the way, let me let, let Metro know, too. They're in the house. What's up, Metro? How you guys doing? Yes, I did. I did. I did shave. I do it every year. It is still. It is still me. It's still me. But uh, let me ask you this: Have you ever been uh, um, like mistaken for someone else by, by mistake? Anybody? Have you? Have you? Have you? Have you? Okay. Have you ever mistaken your, yourself for someone else? <laughs> have you done that? Well, this morning I want to talk about that. I think it's really important for us to realize that sometimes we just misplace ourselves in our lives. And this series, Reclaim, is really all about that. I remember once. Um, I was renting a car and uh, uh, went in there and to, to, to get the, the reservation or get the car. And the guy was like, um, sorry, we don't have anybody. We don't, we don't have your reservation. I was like, yeah, uh, last name Fossil. And he's like, no, don't, no, no one, no one. Name Fossil. I was like, really, no one? Are you sure? He's like, I got a couple of people, but not, n- no, mis- no Fossils. I said, Naeem Fossil, you have no one. He's like, no one. He said, I got, I got Neem Saval. <laughs> Neem Saval, there's a Neem Saval here. As he were, he's picking up a car. I'm like, I'm ne- I am Neem Saval. <laughs> I'm Neem Saval. And that whole trip, uh, I was the guy. I was Neem Saval, which I think sounds cooler, doesn't it? No, it does not. As an author, does Neem Saval. Anyways, no, it doesn't. It still is not good. I don't even know how to spell it. Um, but so this morning, what I want to say uh, is that uh, could it be possible that maybe um, not just other people in your life, uh, but also you have mistaken your identity of who you are. So this series, Reclaim, is about reclaiming, taking back the things in our life, the dreams, the hopes, the visions that we have that we have uh, maybe let go of. We have allowed other things in our life. We've allowed certain things uh, to just overtake us. And then th- we keep on living the, uh, a certain way for a long time. For example, at the beginning of the year, you had these thoughts, these ideas of what you, life could look like. And then what happened? You, life happened, months happened, and you're in this place right now. Now, and uh, guess what? The year is coming to an end, and you still haven't stepped into some of the things that you wanted to step into. You still haven't fit in those jeans that you wanted to, <sighs> you know, or you haven't, you're, you're still not mentally where you want to be in life. So this series is about that, and we kicked off the conversation in the beginning um, of, I mean, last week we t- kicked it off, and it was really a great conversation because we talked about a guy named Gideon, if you remember. And so what I want to do is continue the story. So if you missed last week, what you need to do is go and listen to it because we, we, it was like a conversation number one. It was episode one, and it really is building upon that. And this morning, we're going to continue to do that. Remember last week, we talked about this idea that no condition in your life is permanent. No condition is permanent. So if you find yourself stuck, if you go, this is it, this is as good as it gets, that's not necessarily true. So we've got to get out of that. We had a whole conversation about that. This morning, I want to further uh, talk to you about what, what could God be saying uh, about you? Because again, I want... I know we're going, to go, we're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to go into concepts uh, that might be maybe more expansive than your life and your concern or Monday morning for you. Or the fact that you're going back to, uh, uh, to high school, you're going back to middle school, you're going back to college. I mean, you're, it's back again in the grind of things. I know, what you're, I know that your life is very unique to you, but could it be possible that you might just stop and consider that God is saying something to you about not just the, some of the things you do, but the kind of person you truly are or you were meant to be. And so uh, this talk, this epi- this. A series is a challenge for all of us to maybe really go back to, take back, to, um, go back to the passion that we had, the faith that we had. And so um, check out next week, last week, uh, but this week let's just continue on. So we are at, uh, we're back in Judges, and so Judges 6, we pick it up, uh, verse 16, uh, here really quick. This uh, if you missed last week, it's about Gideon. Uh, he is, uh, God's using him to uh, rescue his people. God gives him a bigger idea of what life could be. He's coming against the Midianites, a particular group of people, and God's speaking to him. And this, this, this whole series is about a conversation that God and him have and what we're learning from that. So verse 16, he continues, that God has already told him in the earlier verses, hey, I'm with you. I want you to go do these things. Again, check out last week. But verse 16 says, the Lord said to him, I will be with you um, and you will destroy the Midianites as... If you were what? Fighting against, help me out. 
one man. So he's like, I'm going to make these conditions really amazing for you. I, I want to let you know I am with you. And so if you don't know anything else about your life, regardless if you think how far you are away from God, you're really not that far. You're really not that far, and God is still with you. And you might think, no, 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 I, I'm telling you, man, the lifestyle I'm living, um, uh, God's not with me. It is not true. There, the, uh, and I've, told this, you told, um, I've talked about this before. If God left you, you would cease to exist. And so God is always with you. He is with you. So verse 17, he continues, and here's what he says. He says, Gideon replied, he says, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. So he's having a conversation with the angel of the Lord, a, a God, and he's saying, I know, but still I want you to prove if you're really God. And so when it comes to your dreams, when it comes to your vision, and when it comes to some of the goals that you have or the life you want to live, the first question based on these passages, this is the first question. The first question is, is this God? Right? Is this idea, is this business idea, is this move, is this relationship, is this uh, frame of mind, is this emotion, is this passion, is it God? Now, if you are a Christian, what I mean by that is, like, you, you, you know you're a Christian. Okay, as in, like, you did the prayer, you've been to the altar, we don't have an altar right now, but you've been to an altar, you've been to all of them, you've come down the aisle, you've said a prayer, you've done it. You're like, man, I, I've got to be a Christian. If I'm not, then I'm, I don't even know what I am then. Like, if you are one of those, then you probably ask the question, is this God? If you are not, uh, and you're trying to figure it out, you're, you've sort of asked this question, is this God? How many of you have uh, raised your hands, even Metro, how many of you have ever thought this, this uh, the, like, about a situation? Is this God? Have you ever thought this? Is it God? Is it God? Is it just me? Is it God? Is it just me? Is it, is it just her? Is it just, it's got to be her. It's got to be her. Oh man, I hope it's her. You know, like, no, no. You know, like, what, 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 what have you thought? Like, is this God? And I th believe that this is not a good question to ask. Like, is this God? Because this is what we ask. Now, what, it mean, what I mean by that is, is that the, really, the question is, is this how God, God wired you up to be? See, for so oft, so, for so many, I guess, I don't know, centuries, when it comes to conversations about what people of faith should do as they follow their uh, God, the question is always, God, you, are, you asked me to do this, uh, and I'm wondering, is, is this you? And it, when you look at people in the scriptures, and you, you, they, they, they've done these amazing things, you go, wow, this ordinary per person has done this extraordinary thing. Or this m m less, the, the, m the least qualified person has ended up doing um, some amazing things. It's like the least has, uh, among everybody has become the, the most important person. I mean, when you hear these epic stories, sometimes we lose um, the big idea here or the truth of it because we romanticize them a little bit. The, what I'm trying to say is, is that when you read the stories of amazing men and women in the Scriptures, um, they're not just um, people that all of a sudden God just radically realigned and reshaped and changed their personalities and changed their resources, and they just became a totally different person, and then they stepped into the role. The truth is, is that when you and I struggle with the question, is this God? When you look at the scriptures, you find when God uses people, he uses people who are, in one sense, um, resourced to do what he's called to do. When you look at the story of Moses, you look at all the things Moses had going for him, he was the ideal person to rescue his people. When you look at Paul, the apostle, who went in and evangelized uh, the, uh, the rest of the world, I mean, he took the movement of Jesus out of the Jewish context and into uh, in the Gentile world. I mean, that's why we have church here, because Paul took it. The disciples did not. I mean, again, when you look at his upbringing and teachings and his resources and influence, you go, of course, he's the guy that God wanted to pick. All this to say, when you think of this dream, this idea that you have, the big question really is, if you want to answer the question, is this God, you have to say, is this how gar God wired me up to be? Like, is this the person God wired me up? Is your talent, your personality, your research aligned to the dream, the hope, the vision, the purpose you have? 
Because I know plenty of people who believe in, in this idea. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish what? Anything that is baloney. That's that. I mean, ask any American Idol, any any uh, you know, uh, like a uh, dancing show, any show out there who's got talent. I mean, you ask people who tell their kids, if you put your you can do anything if you put your mind to it. That is not true, right? And as and as family of those people who are trying to sing, you're like, please stop. Like, like, don't do this, don't do this. Because what we tell people is, is like, no, no, you can radically change or you can just go after whatever you want. It's not necessarily true. God has wired you up with particular talents, a particular personality. He's given you a resource. You're here in Charlotte, North Carolina for a reason. So the context and the content uh, of your character and all of those things matter. And when you want to answer the question, is this God? Gideon said, I, I need to know. We ask the same thing. You have to answer, the, you have to ask the question, is this how God, God wired me up? That's the question. Is it, is it, is it how God kind of wired me up? Because let me just let you know, if you want it, want this thing to be God, like it, you want it to be God's idea and blessing from God, all you have to do is, is this authentically you? See, when, when you live out of who you are, you fulfill God's will. There isn't a God's will out there that you got to discover. But if you look at who you are and you're true to your, true to your, you're honest with yourself, you're in prayer, you're talking to people, when you discover and uh, have moments um, of real truth about the limitations, the imperfections, and the talent of your life. And you, when you begin to live out of that, you live out God's will for your life. It's not a will out there. You know, there's a, there's a concept. It's called um, uh, Ikea, um, Ikea Gai. It's, 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 um, uh, it's a Japanese concept that I stumbled upon, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. You've probably seen these Venn diagrams before, um, and some of them have like three circles, but this one's pretty interesting. Uh, obviously, it's a, J a Japanese concept. It's a way of life, but, but I loved these four circles because in trying to discover who you are, he, he, they've got these, these circles here that really ask some interesting questions. Number one, what you love. And so if you're trying to discover, is this God, what do you love? Because what you love, God has put that love in you for a reason, and that's God's will for you. Um, what are you good at? Like, no, no, sweetheart, you can't do that, because you're not good at that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've got to be honest. I know you love it. I know you love to do this. I know you love, I love the violin, but if you play that again, I'm going to... I'm going to break that over your head. You know, I'm like, I'm going to, I'm just going to, okay? Now, th th here's the other one. What can you be paid for? That's a great one, parents. Okay, I know you love, you love poetry, but no one's going to pay for that. You know what I'm saying? Like, wh 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 what can you be paid for? What can you be paid for? And then, and this is a, the, a great one. Uh, can you see this? It says, what does the world need? What the world needs. You see, this a diagram, for me at least, gives a great and clear picture of is this God when it comes to your dreams, hopes, visions? Do you love it? Is there a, is there a passion around there? Um, are you good at that? Can that be a profession? You know? Uh, can it be a, a vocation? Can it be something that you get paid for? And is there a mission around that? Is it something that the world needs? See, if you're only in one circle, I just want to do what I love, then you don't care what the world needs. And when you don't care what the world needs, yeah, you're really being successful. And then if you do this, and you're like, no one's paying for it, that's great. You're the, you're the broke, nonprofit guy, girl, that loved this and loved this. You're good at this, but no one wants to pay for that. So could it be possible that God's saying, here's how you are going to find out if this is me. Find out 
if all of these are connected. Now, you can obviously Google this and look, this, look it up online, but it's worth for you to discover this. Let's go to the next one. The next idea in this passage is, is really fascinating to me. J- Judges 6.25. So we, are, we, are fa- we kind of fast forward through this a little bit. And as we fast forward this, what we realize is that the, God is wanting him to do something in particular. And here's what he says. It says, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, okay, pull, pull down your father's altar to Baal, to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Now, let me give you the context. Basically, what he's doing is he's telling, I, here's how you're going to rescue my people. You're going to get rid of the sacred cow in their life. You're going to get rid of the other God in their lives. You're going to destroy uh, the point of affection and worship and the, the, uh, the attention that the Jewish people are pouring into this particular God. If, you, if I'm going to step in here, you have to take out the other God out there. So the question for us when it comes to our purpose, when it comes to moving forward in our life and in God's will in our life, here's the question, right? The next question is what? This is it. What has been a what? A God. What has been a God in your life? And you might think, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's been a God. No, no. What's been a sacred cow in your life? What's been this sacred activity? What's been this person in your life? For example, if this person or this opportunity left, if it was no longer an option, if this job was no longer an option, if this activity was no longer an option, if this, if this context was no longer an option, if this uh, quality of life was no longer an option, if this relationship, thing, job, whatever, it was no longer an option, would it just totally destroy you? Is it a God? Has there become, has it become a God in your life? See, so for so many of us, for so many of us, this idea of reclaiming our lives is so attractive. But the thought of giving up or surrendering, or stopping, or tearing down an altar that's built to something else is extremely hard for us. We, 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 um, and we, we, we struggle with it because it's, it's a loss, isn't it? It's a loss of things. It's, and then when you have this loss, you're like, I'm not quite sure if I'm gaining or moving forward in life because I feel like the most important thing, the one thing that gives me kind of, uh, I don't know, um, sense of security is leaving or has left. Now, could it be possible that maybe God is saying, hey, if you want to reclaim your life, you have to move out of security and into insecurity. Like you have to have a moment where you step out in faith. You you step out and do something in the process. You step out and have this conversation. You step out and start doing some things that frankly, you don't know if they're gonna pan out. Are you and I willing to do that? I'm gonna start this, um, I'm gonna start taking this medication. I'm gonna start taking this, uh, I'm gonna start going to therapy. I'm gonna start, doing this activity. I'm going, to start, I'm going to start because you don't know the end and it's so, you're so anxious about it. And God's saying, hey, hey, um, there's a God you've set up in your life, the sense of security, and this thing gives you security. If you want to move forward, if you want to reclaim your life, you got to tear down the sacred cow in your life. Because you know this and I know this, that whatever we give our attention to shapes us, doesn't it? Whatever we give our attention to shapes us. How many of you would admit this? Okay, and I will admit it. How many of you, before you go to bed, you go through your phone and scan um, either Facebook or Instagram? Anybody? Come on. Okay, the others. Okay, how many of you struggle with lying? The rest of you, let's, let's. Okay, I know it's a terrible habit. I get it. I get that. But how many of you check out your phone before you go to bed? Can I get an amen or something? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Okay? It's an addiction. It's it's an appreciation, whatever it is. Whatever it is. But it's a habit that we keep on doing. We all tend to get into that. And what we give our uh, attention to begins to shape us. What we worship begins to shape us. 
Let me read you another passage of scripture here, okay? Um, the other passage, actually, might not be in your, uh, it's, it's extra. It's uh, Proverbs 9.10. It says this, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord uh, is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, okay? The, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You've also possibly heard the passage, um, the, 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 great com- uh, the, the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Like, like the, you know, it's, it's, it's like the first thing you need to do is love God. And here he's saying the one thing you need to fear is God himself. Now, if you've ever heard this before, and if you have, you wonder, why is he talking about fear? Like, why is he asking us to fear God? Here's why. Because when you and I begin to put our hope and our security on something that is so expansive and is as big as eternity, your life is limitless. But if you begin to fear people, relationships, the lack of losing this particular job or losing this particular activity or losing this particular physical condition, if you begin to put that as your fear, it is not wisdom. Because when you and I put our fear and security on things that are temporarily, like people and places and things, our lives are limited. And so when the writer says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and, the, 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 and life itself is knowing God, what he's truly saying is, if you begin to put your hope If you put your love and affection, if there's no other God but God, your life becomes just like him. He is what? Limitless. And your life now is limitless. For so many of us, we put our faith in people who are temporary, in things and jobs, in hopes and dreams, in contexts that actually are not going to sustain ourselves. And guess what? We live limited lives. And I love the passage when he, when he says either the knowledge of God is like frees you up as well. Because the word mystery, right? The word mystery is, is when you look at the word, it's not what we think it is. The word mystery does not mean something that you cannot know. Did you know that? The word mystery actually means something that you can know again and again and again, and again. There is no limit to knowing this thing. It is a mystery. We have taken the word and said, no, it's the thing you cannot understand. And so when the writers, the Jewish writers, we talk about God, they say he's the great mystery. You know what they're saying? It's not the one who you cannot understand or he's always hiding. He is the one that continually is revealing new things about himself. See, that's the life you want to. But that starts with asking yourself, when it comes to this dream, um, okay, is this God? Is this, is this how God wired me up? But then, is there another God out there? Is there a sacred cow out there that I need to take down, slaughter, something that's been there? I mean, for Gideon's context, it was seven years. It's like something that's been removed, something that needs to be just removed because it's been there for such a long time. And so the next passage of scripture actually kind of goes along with the idea of like when you have something like an activity or a person or a frame of mind or a particular belief for such a long time, it's hard to let go of it. And Judges 6, he continues in verse 32, he says, from then on, Gideon was called uh, Jerbel. So, so he named, his name changed. The word Gideon actually means minor or worker. Jerbel is the word for contender. It actually means the one who contended, right? Who let Baal, who let, who Baal defeated, who let Baal defeat himself because he broke down Baal, Baal's altar. So this Baal, Baal or Baal, I'm not quite sure how the Jewish people would say it, but I, all I do know is, is that there was this altar that he took down which def, totally defined his future, so Gideon's name was now changed. What's the point in that? What does that even mean? So you got a guy who God starts speaking to, says, hey, I need you to take back your life, 
And your life is not just for you, but also for your people. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to come against this, this God out there. I want you to destroy this. And then people, when they find out that he's actually done this, uh, they challenge him. Even the Jewish people challenge him. And then they give him, give him a totally different name. And you could easily make the connection that his name changed from a guy who was like this worker, because that's what Gideon means, a miner, to a guy who contends with the gods. His identity changed. So what does that even mean to us? I think it asks us this last question. What are you no longer? Now, I, for, 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 on purpose, I did not want to put no longer going to be, because for you it might be, what am I no longer going to do? What am I, what am I just going to stop doing anymore? But what are you no longer going to be? Who is that person you are no longer going to be? Uh, we all love the idea of a new kind of life. We all love the idea of having a, having a more fulfilling life. I know I do. But the idea of God changing my name to Neam Saval, I'm not quite sure. But if God changing my name to someone else, God changing my identity, that's a little hard for me. There's a Jewish um, um, saying, it says, and Jesus quoted it often. He says, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. And he says that because he says, you know, obviously, and they knew this, and they knew, they were, they were, they were familiar with their wine, and they're like, yeah, of course you can't, because new wine will expands and the old wine skins will burst. So you, you don't, you never do that. See, for so many of us, we want this new life, this new purpose, this new passion, this new season. And for some of you, you're at the point of it. Maybe, you know, you maybe, maybe you found out you're having a baby. Whee! Right? Sort of, wee, I don't know. Or you're really pumped about that. Maybe you found out, hey, you're moving. Or, hey, uh, I just got engaged. Or, uh, we're having our, I don't know, uh, the, I'm getting this job opportunity. There, there's a point of which you're like, I see our future, that it's going to look different. I see it because the environment of my life is changing. It's just going to change. That's good. That's good. But the question is, can your, can your old life contain this new purpose that God wants to pour into? Like, are you going to just walk in to this new season of your life as the old guy or, or gal? I mean, are you, are you going to walk into as just being the person you've always been? Or could God say, hey, before you move into this, I need you to no longer be this person. And could you imagine sitting down and thinking, what am I no longer going to be? What am I no longer going to do? See, that is a, that is a not just a practical step, but that might be the most nerve-wracking step for you. It might be the... Um, Man, it might be the most um, scariest thing for you to go, I'm no longer going to be, I'm no longer going to do, I'm no longer going to think, I'm no longer going to live. I mean, and you fill it in. I'm no longer going to tolerate. I'm no longer going to be this way. Like, you're, man, that, my friends, is profound. Because one of the other threads um, or the things about people that God has used that um, you'll notice if you read the scriptures and you read a lot of them, God takes the time to change people's names. And you wonder just why. Because for so many of us, we need uh, 
to stop doing a whole, a whole bunch of things or a few really powerful things we need to stop doing before we start anything else. And for some of us, we just go, we just, we just think that we need to just keep on going. We just need to keep on starting new things. So what is it? What is in your life? What are you going to stop doing today? What are you? No longer going to be that person. For some of us, I mean, I think this is a very important conversation because if we're going to really take back and get back the passion in our lives, we've got to ask these hard questions of ourselves. Hey, is there a, is there a God that I've set up? Is there a, this is who I am, this is my person? Is there, is there, is there, um, is there this, um, the cycle that you're just stuck in because you're like, I don't know if this is God. I'm not quite sure this is God. Is this, is this, what, what are you wrestling with? And let me ask you this. Could it be possible that for some subconscious way, you're, you're in fact waiting on permission. You're waiting on permission from someone to be someone that you know you need to be. You're waiting on permission to live this life that you want to live. And we know the phrase, right? You know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than what? But I think some of us, we're, we just don't believe that we have permission from God to pursue our passions. And it is tough. If you wait on everyone around you to give you permission to change and transform and become the person you were meant to be, You'll never move because some people in your life, the ones that are supposed to love you the most, will not give you permission to change because they've always known you as this kind of person. So I want to pray for you because I believe that for so many of us, these, this conversation can change the rest of your life. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us. We know that it changes us. It, it, it allows us to step in to the person we were meant to be. God, I know that for so many of us, uh, moving from uh, a sense of uh, security, even though we're, we're secure in a place that's not really that comfortable or we're secure in a place that's not really successful or we're secure in a place that's not really fulfilling, we're still secure. And God, for so many of us, we lack the courage to move into a place of ambiguity, a place that is a little bit in, has a little bit of insecurity in there, a, a sense of we quite not, we don't know what it's going to do and how it's going to, uh, how it's going to all pan out. But God, I pray, I pray that God, that we would have the courage to ask ourselves the important questions and to move towards the life that you've called us to live. God, I pray that we would reclaim the passion, reclaim the mission, reclaim, Lord God, the talents, the resources that we have. And we would do this in light of the fact that you want to use us not to just benefit us, but benefit the world around us. So God, give us the courage to do that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, hey, 